Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ashokan. I'm the executive director of CPI. So on behalf of uh, CPI, let me welcome you to the second of the series of events that we are holding to mark uh, Cybersecurity Month. Uh, those of you who were here last week uh, would remember the context of the first two events. The first two events are panels in uh, areas where University of Waterloo is uh, taking a leadership role in the National Cybersecurity Consortium. So today's panel is on software security, which is one of those areas. And uh, uh, um, it'll be led by uh, my colleague, uh, uh, May Nagapan. Next slide, please. May is an associate professor of computer science uh, uh, at the University of Waterloo. He's also the current holder of the uh, Ross and Muriel Cheriton uh, uh, Fellowship. Uh, May is also the leader of the Software Security Network in NCC. And, uh, and today's uh, panel is on that theme. Uh, May, if you can turn your video on and take over. Thank you, Ashokan. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to make uh, a territorial acknowledgement. Um, uh, the University of Waterloo and uh, I acknowledge that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus, uh, which includes uh, Ashokan's office, my office, uh, and where we live, is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land that is granted to the Six Nations, that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across campuses. And I would really encourage everyone to look at what our Indigenous Initiatives Office are doing. Uh, with that acknowledgement, uh, I'd like to introduce the panel now. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, four uh, excellent uh, researchers from academia and industry in our panel uh, today. All four of them actually are also part of the software security network at the NCC. Uh, first, we have uh, Glenn Worcester, who's a distinguished researcher at uh, BlackBerry. Uh, then we have Kareem Ali, who's an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. Uh, then we have Stephen Ding, who's an assistant professor at Queen's University. And finally, Yusra Afer, who's an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo Chariton School of Computer Science. So with that, I'll kind of start the uh, panel discussion itself. Uh, I'll start and, and um, I'll start with the I mean, uh, discussion on, let me start the discussion with an introduction first. I just introduced everybody's names, but I want to give them an opportunity to talk about what uh, they are working on as well. So if each of you could introduce yourself and briefly mention what aspects of security you work on, that'll be great. And I'll kind of go uh, clockwise in my panel. Uh, I'll start with Glenn. All right, thanks. Uh, my name is Glenn Worcester. Uh, I have an undergrad in computer science from the University of Waterloo. Uh, my undergrad, again, was computer science, but there was also a minor or a electrical engineering electives built into there, so a little bit of lower level stuff. After I finished that, I did a master's and a PhD in computer security. My focus there was on designing systems that application developers were less able to compromise the security of the entire system. Uh, since then, I have been at BlackBerry, so I've been at BlackBerry, I think, about 11 years now. All of those years in the security research group. The security research group is make sure that the BlackBerry products we deliver to our customers don't have any security issues in them. Uh, and so that involves a number of things, finding vulnerabilities in the products, uh, as well as research into new ways to find those vulnerabilities in the products and research into new ways to defend against attacks that might happen against those products. Um, my background is a combination of security and the embedded space, operating systems, firmware. Uh, now, BlackBerry as a company has a lot of different products. I generally focus on Ivy and Qnix. And related to my involvement with them, I'm also the head of the Canadian delegation to ISO for road vehicle cybersecurity. 
So we just finished up work on ISO 21434, which is the Road Vehicle Cybersecurity Engineering Standard. And it is focused on the processes for being secure, mostly related to embedded software running on the vehicle. Thank you so much, Glenn, and welcome to the panel. Uh, next, I'll go to Stephen. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Nakapen. Um, so um, my name is Steven. So um, um, thank you for having me join this uh, wonderful discussion. So I'm an assistant uh, professor at Queen's University. Um, so at um, our lab here, um, we mainly work on developing the um, new AI-based solution for cybersecurity incidents response. Um, let's say for reverse engineering, for um, advanced persistent threat group tracking, let's say the hacker group tracking. Uh, for example, uh, working on the antivirus and malware solutions or um, the autonomous uh, pen testing uh, paradigm. So we also work on um, the uh, new security protections for AI-based applications. Um, so you know, nowadays we have so many AI, like AI applications, smart home device, uh, uh, like, you know, in our, around our house, right? So um, uh, we also work closely with uh, BlackBerry, the silence team, um, on their uh, security instance, uh, instance response. So my background is um, um, it's more like a combination of uh, data mining. Data mining is a, is, is, is a less training word this day, right? So people like AI, the future intelligence or data science, those terms are more popular. So my, uh, my background is more traditional data mining background and also have some um, backgrounds in cybersecurity. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, next, I'll go to Yusra. Yeah, thank you, May. Thanks for the invitation to participate in this panel. So I'm an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. My research focuses on mobile device security. Specifically, my research aims to create automated system to identify and address threats in the mobile and smart frameworks by combining fundamental system insights and program analysis techniques. So the automated system that I built can best benefit uh, mobile vendors like Google, Samsung, and LG to identify and fix vulnerabilities that can be leveraged to deliver safer and secure systems to the mobile end users. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yusra. Welcome to the panel. And finally, we have Karim. Thanks, May. Uh, I'm very grateful to be with all of you here. My name is Karim Ali. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta, where I'm leading the Maple Lab or the Programming Languages uh, Research Lab. Um, my work in software security is related to primarily information uh, flow security. So these are the kind of program analyses that we develop in the group that will detect things like does your application or does your code may leak your credit card information or does it or may, may it leak your passwords and so on and so forth. Uh, we have been working on, on various different applications of data flow analysis and information flow security. Mobile applications is one of them. Uh, cryptography is a, is a big uh, part of the work that the group has been doing in the past few years. And more recently, I found myself more interested in applications of game, game theory and, and game theoretic setups in, 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 in the area of program analysis. Uh, my background, somehow it's also related to Waterloo. So I did my master's and PhD at Waterloo as well. Uh, my master's was in network security because that's what I was interested in at, a, at the time, especially coming from my undergrad uh, program where I did a lot of work on security, on hands-on work. Uh, and then my PhD in programming languages. And then I got to sort of like merge both backgrounds together in some of the research that I have been doing together with my colleagues and my students so far. Thank you so much, Karim. And before we jump into the panel, I just want to also let the audience know that there should be a Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, I'll try to moderate and I'll try to get the questions to the panel and uh, uh, kind of answer them as well. Okay, thank you so much. And with that, I'll jump to the first question that I was gonna ask uh, the panel, which is um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day research, right? Like what aspects of it do you like the most? What aspects of it did you like the least because it's it's a challenge that you probably don't want to address. So 
Um, I can again kind of start in the reverse order this time. I can start with Kareem. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, I, I, I like, I mean, the thing that got me interested in security in the first place, which what is the thing that I like the most about this line of work is that it's, it's this cat and mouse chase, like whatever you're going to figure out and whatever solution that you're going to come up with, attackers eventually will get, will get to it and they will know that how to evade these kind of detection techniques and so on. So it's kind of a, it's kind of nice that this problem will exist forever so it guarantees basically our work that we're going to have like jobs for life kind of thing uh um, that might be a bit tiring but that's the, one of the exciting things about it uh but i think the biggest challenge that i've i've, I've seen so far in, in in the work that we've been doing is having um available data sets so you want to evaluate your technique against real world problems that people face there and it is hard to get your hands on these data sets because anything that is related to security would be specific to maybe like certain company or certain institution or organization. And, and having that availability of those data sets is, is not easy to come around because of all the private information that will might be leaked or might be uh, uh, revealed from, from, from having this data set publicly available and so on. And I think that's one of the things that uh, maybe our research community should put in more work and more effort on how we can make those data sets or how we can make data sets that would resemble or would simulate what happens in real world that doesn't leak certain information that companies and institutions don't want to be leaked. Great. Thank you so much, Karim. Uh, Yusra? Yeah, so I agree with a lot of points that uh, Karim has just men mentioned. Um, I guess that the challenges that, uh, the, uh, that I face can be divided into two main streams depending on the research goal that I try to address. So there are challenges that are related to the security evaluation part, and then there are other challenges that are related to the security hardening. So if we're talking about the security evaluation, I think that the biggest challenge that I face is to construct a hacker's perspective of a system. Uh, being able to think like an attacker is very difficult. There exists a big disconnect between the academic security research and the practical or hacking side. So although an attack by an attacker or by a hacker may seem non-systematic, it does provide a lot of insight into the system because uh, attackers have like deep insights about how system function. They can also foresee how a system may malfunction under specific unexpected environments. So uh, being able to describe an execution mechanism present in this attacked environment, which is unforeseen to the system developer or to the normal user is very challenging. We need to figure out what could go wrong in case of uh, maybe a design flaw or um, an expected interaction with other components or with other programs. And also maybe just simply because of unexpected environment setup. So this description is very important to prove that a system or a program may misbehave if an attacker supplies some specific inputs. Now, the challenges that I face when developing detection techniques is twofold. First of all, all the solution that we create needs to be uh, adhering to known security standards, uh, known usable security standards. So they have to be easily deployable and they have to uh, not cause any extra annoyance for the user. And of course, not causing any overhead in terms of performance or battery consumption. So the mobile devices are resource constrained. Any underperforming solution is simply impractical. So uh, the second challenge, and I think uh, Karim has already mentioned that, is that any solution that we create will eradicate, would not eradicate a problem. It will just raise the bar for attackers. So um, I think that researchers and the hackers or, uh, secure, or attackers are in this arms race. Uh, so now concerning about uh, what I like, uh, I like investigating and constructing this uh, attacker's perspective. It's a uh, very challenging, but at the same time, it's a very interesting task. Now, what I dislike is being able to convince the vendors to adopt our solutions because vendors have different and other priorities. They need to meet some specific product deadlines and that sometimes comes at the cost of security to some extent. Thank you so much, Yusra. Uh, I'll kind of, after I hear from Stephen and Glenn as well, I want to kind of 
dive in a little bit more on some of these points that you've touched. Uh, Stephen, do you have any? Um, yeah, I think it, think it may. So um, yeah, so I, I totally agree with uh, so many points that already made by uh, uh, by, by Karim and, and, and Yusra. Um, so, um, so for me, um, just like you sort of say, I uh, think like a thing from the attacker's perspective, right? So for me, so that is actually the most, uh, most, uh, most challenging part. And also that's the part I like the most because, um, um, so in cybersecurity, we always have the presence of uh, constantly changing threat actors. So the attackers, they're not static, right? You know what I mean? They're, they're human being, right? They have strategy, they have their, their, they have their goal oriented mission like tasks or missions, right? So they are also changing. Um, so the behavior they observe from different security artifacts that um, are launched by different hackers groups are also changing. So um, they use different um, new anti-analysis techniques uh, uh, to protect, to prevent the, let's say, malware from analysis. Uh, and nowadays the malware has uh, so many variants than maybe five to 10 years ago. So for example, let's say in Canada, our cyber center, our cyber center roughly takes uh, uh, 200,000, 200,000 malware per day. And most of them are unique. It's like most of them are, you never see them in the past. They're new variant. Somehow change them uh, by change a little bit of themselves. And this requires a, a very scalable and efficient system as a backbone processing pipeline for all this uh, threat data. So this number is roughly the same for most of the antivirus company, like roughly between 100K to 200K per day as the ingest, uh, in, as the as the intake. Um, so that part is very challenging, uh, challenging because uh, uh, this is too much data, right? There's too much things and things that keep changing very fast. But this also what I really like about cybersecurity is so you're not actually kind of uh, working with some static or imaginary target, but it's actually somebody that you're fighting against. Right? Um, um, so the least, uh, as the, 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 um, the, the, um, the least, uh, um, part that like, I, I, I like to the least part in cybersecurity, just like Karim has mentioned, is data set. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of from a different perspective. So we work with industrial partners, we work with governments, we do have wonderful data, but it's difficult to share, right? So there's so many restrictions on publications, on the IP property, on the data set, on many, many things. And it takes years to negotiate a contract of uh, data sharing and and which makes the research uh, difficult to reproduce, right? Reproducibility is a very important when you do research, right? So um, um, it also, um, 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 of course, there are many efforts being uh, developed in this direction. Let's say instead of releasing the actual data, we release certain representation of the data or kind of uh, another way, release, let's say the hash of the data but still, uh, compared to the, the other domains in data mining or let's say in AI in general, we are way behind in data sharing. Um, so this is something that I, I, I honestly, I really don't like. Yeah, because for cybersecurity, we, we want to have a very transparent, very open environment for everybody to contribute to the overall security of the general public, right? Um, and the second thing that I don't like is, uh, um, is, is uh, there are more things to protect this thing. Right, so you have the cell phone device, like uh, for for your so you have the mobile like mobile device, IoT device, and now you have the cars that can do software updates, the cars that have a lot of complicated AI solutions in the car, and you know AI solution from the point of security perspective and privacy protection is a really worst idea because there's so many uncertainty involved, right? You can't actually predict every single possible move of an AI model, right? So sometimes just uh, the corner case is difficult to kind of uh, predict and kind of constrain. So um, um, that is the second part that I really don't like is because the attack rate is becomes much more larger and we don't have that much resource and people working on this domain, right? If you look at the market study, workforce study uh, in cybersecurity, there's always a huge market gap. Like, uh, like right before, right before pandemic, I think globally we have around two million, uh, around two million um, um, uh, positions. Like right now, open, empty, nobody. There's no a suitable candidate filling like uh, filling the position globally. Right in North America, I think before pandemic is roughly uh, uh, five hundred thousand. But after pandemic, you can imagine the number jumps up like uh, uh, quickly, right? Because there's so many attacks are happening after, right? So um, that's the things that I, 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 um, 
um, I really don't like is that, yeah, we need more people, right? So if you are interested in doing cybersecurity, yeah, please uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. There's actually a question from the audience member as well, and this was going to be one of the questions to the panel, and I'll come back to it on what students can do. But uh, for now, I'll first uh, go to Glenn. And Glenn, on top of what you were going to say, could you also maybe comment on, because you're coming from industry, on what the challenges are in, from your perspective on the data sets and, and also on adoption? What can be made easier for adoption to happen in industry? Yeah, sure, I can talk about that. Um, I'll start off, though, answering the first question of what do you love and what do you hate about working in security? Um, and I think for me, the, one of the things that I really enjoy is that computer security or software security is kind of like the digital equivalent of taking your bicycle apart to see how it works. Um, but at the same time, it's also building something new. So not only am I trying to figure out how it works, but I'm also trying to build on top of that to make something better and more secure. Um, in computers, we're really good at abstractions to hide complexity, but when you understand what's going on behind those abstractions, you're much more likely to find the security issues that end up resulting from them. Um, I think the, probably the biggest thing that I hate is finding the same problem over and over again, um, because it means that we're not learning from our mistakes or the mistake is too easy to make, right? I could tell you, hey, don't put a cross-site scripting vulnerability in your code, but the fact that we keep finding them all over the place means that probably it's too easy a mistake to make and we need to do a whole lot better on that one. Um, in terms of the biggest challenges, I think, I'm gonna actually speak not on behalf of BlackBerry here, um, but just speaking as myself as an individual. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that security is contextual. Um, and so, Others have already mentioned here speaking like an attacker or thinking like an attacker, um, but what is the attacker capable of doing? Are they a remote attacker that's coming in through the network? Are they local attacker? Are they a physical attacker, right? Is the physical attacker wielding a hammer or are they wielding a scanning electron microscope? Because those are two very, very different attackers. Uh, and if we say that a system is secure, what is it actually secure against? What, what do we assume the attacker is capable of doing? And as, again, others have already mentioned, the assumptions that we're making about what the attacker is capable of doing seem to be changing um, as they come up with new things. Uh, so finding that right context of, okay, well, what do we design our system to be secure against is, is a challenge. Um, another big problem that I have is that we can't actually prove that real world code is vulnerability free. So real world code ends up being free from vulnerabilities until we discover it's not. And sometimes it's the good guys that discover that it's not free from vulnerabilities and sometimes it's the bad guys that discover it's not free from vulnerabilities. We'd rather it's the good guys that discover it first, um, but that doesn't always happen. Um, so if you actually take a look at tools that we can use to help with that static and dynamic analysis. Static analysis is okay at finding a lot of the low hanging fruit, um, but it's, it's plagued by false positives and things that it can't just really digest very well. Um, dynamic analysis doesn't really necessarily have the same false positive issue, but then it's plagued by unreachable code or I can only figure out or analyze stuff that I can get to. Um, and the attacker doesn't need to find all the issues, they just have to find one. Um, and I guess the third one, which I think others have mentioned as well, is that fixing the vulnerabilities after they have been found is hard. Um, and a lot of the attacks that we're seeing are not new and novel vulnerabilities. Sure, those attacks are the ones that hit the news, but things like the ransomware and whatnot, a lot of those are attacking vulnerabilities that we already know they exist, they're just in systems that haven't been fixed. Um, and that's a time and resources problem. Yeah, and, and, and that's gonna be my next question on how to get more resources, but could you comment a little bit on the adoption and the data sets from an industry standpoint, Glenn? Yeah, so um, uh, data sets are an interesting problem, right? Because we do have the issues of um, privacy. Um, and in fact, 
privacy is is a very forefront issue on a lot of this. Um, it is possible to work with businesses. Um, it's it's a time and resources thing even there um, of trying to make sure that you've got the right relationship set up, um, that you're talking to the right people. And yeah, sometimes sometimes we need to ship products. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you so much, uh, Glenn. And, and with that, I kind of was going to ask this later in the um, uh, discussion, but I'll jump to it because one of the audience members as well had this question. Um, on um, what can students who are interested okay, in um, cybersecurity and software security and cryptography and things like this, what kind of uh, opportunities can they expect uh, in terms like after graduation? And what uh, uh, what kind of opportunities do they have after graduation? And I'll, I think I'll start with Glenn this time because he's he's in the industry who <laughs> might be looking for more people, right? In, indeed, and we actually try and hire co-ops every term too. I'll just I'll just throw that plug in there. Um, I think if I were to take a look at security, there's there's two kind of roads that you can go down, and then probably in fact it diverges into all sorts of different roads. Um, but uh, you could take a look at deploying security, and so how do you set up a system and do it security how, securely? How do you integrate security into existing systems? Um, and so you take a look at IT security and network security and all of these other sorts of fields, right? Um, and then there's all the other flip side of it, which is um, looking at security during software development, uh, and that applies actually to all software, not just security software, because even if you are building a chat app these days, you know, security might not be the main thing that you're looking for, but you still need to consider it in all of the features and all of the things that you're doing. Um, and so going down that road, finding new and better ways to identify vulnerabilities, um, or maybe even just using the ways that we do already have to find vulnerabilities and just using them better. Um, maybe it's better protecting the software against the vulnerabilities that you didn't find, and maybe you're interested in exploring that particular thing. Um, but there's even options, even if you're not a developer. Um, there's a lot of buzz going around right now to do with uh, supply chain attacks. Um, and there was an executive order, I believe, that came out of the U.S. to do with, okay, improving the nation's cybersecurity posture. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done on just integrating security into everything. Um, and so again, even if you're not a developer, um, there's still work to be done in there. Um, you could talk about usable security, right? And how do we actually take these systems? And I think this is something that Yusuf had said. How do we take these systems and actually make them usable by people who are not developers? Uh, there's probably, there's probably a lot of focus on the people who are on this particular panel or in this particular or listening to it that they're already interested in security. But how do we protect the people who aren't interested in security? Um, and let's take that even a step further, right? Um, and say, okay, well, now that we've got maybe some security here, how do we do privacy? Thank you so much, Glenn. And now to the academics, I also want to kind of add what are some of the things that are happening in the schools to kind of, are we training people to become cybersecurity experts or are we training every developer to know something about security? What is it that we are also trying to do? If you can comment a little bit on that too. Uh, and I'll start with Steven. Uh, you're on mute, Steven. I'm muted, yeah, I'm, I still did it like, yeah. So after so many online meetings, so anyway, so um, so um, uh, maybe like going back to uh, like our initial discussions on the opportunities. So I think following what uh, uh, Grant mentioned, so there are so so there are a lot of different there are a lot of different um, um, needs. Like the the people need to need security consideration from software development, from supply chain. So so cybersecurity 
uh, is needed in so many different uh, uh, disciplines and domains. So if you just, let's say, regarding opportunity, let's say if you finish your undergrad study, you just go to LinkedIn, you go to Glassdoor, you go to Blank, you search, search. there's so many open positions already, like in so many different um, uh, domains, different, so across uh, supply chains, or, or the, even this day for CPS, a cyber, uh, cyber physical system, right? Because a lot of cyber security people put a Wi-Fi and, you know, they connect to the internet, so provides a perfect opportunity for attackers to attack critical infrastructure. So even for those uh, infrastructure, uh, they also have uh, uh, um, um, the, the security uh, analysis or, or security uh, um, um, researchers position open. Like the, one of the interesting observations is that last week, one of our undergrad students gets uh, to uh, Leblon, right? Leblon is a mark like, you know, to do, do groceries, right? But they have the security researcher positions, right? Because the supply chain issue that people have to stay. Um, and, and for the opportunities, I think, um, 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 based on the survey, based on the survey in the past, so having having certifications in security, having graduate degrees in security does help people get a higher pay uh, in the security and moving up their career faster based on the surveys in the past. So definitely going forward, uh, if your interest is in cybersecurity, definitely uh, uh, having a graduate a degree is a good endorsement of your security skills and, and the, the, the security mindset. Um, and I believe that in Waterloo, there's a nice, uh, you know, nice graduate programs for cybersecurity. And for Queens, we also have the answer cybersecurity program. And for um, 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 the other university, they also have a specialized uh, security program as well. So in Canada, we are we are we are, we are opening a, a lot of new security programs because we see there's a workforce, there's a there's a need for the actual experts in this, this domain to help us to protect the critical access of the critical Canadian access, right? Um, um, so that is uh, uh, maybe regarding opportunity part. And besides of BlackBerry is hiring, there's so many uh, security companies also hiring. Sophos Vancouver is hiring right now, um, um, and uh, the EST. Uh, Montreal is also hiring right now. CCCS, CCCS is our cybersecurity center, but they're hiring all year round. CSE Canada, DND, they're hiring all year round. So there's a, a lot of opportunity, a lot of things going on. If you just just Google like anything that you can find. So um, uh, it's because uh, yeah, we, we we need people to work on uh, this uh, work on this domain. And, uh, and another thing that I maybe I want to show is. Uh, uh, is for is is more for cyber center. So cyber center also have a lot of hackathon events uh, for people to kind of uh, brush up their cyber security uh, uh, hacking skills. So they have the Geek Week, Geek Peak, and Geek Peak Capstones events this day. So if you just Google uh, cyber security center, their front page already show their event calendar. So um, um, you will uh, work with uh, uh, um, people like. Grad, like people that work with security issues every day um, um, on a specific project and then gain some experience from uh, from this project. So I think that could be also a very uh, nice experience for you to at least see uh, what does it feel like to actually work in cybersecurity, right? So, uh, and and uh, regarding uh, May's uh, request on commenting the, um, um, comment the, the, uh, uh, um, the, is it research aspect? I, I forgot. Yeah. Is it you mentioned? I was, just, I was just asking: should should we be creating cybersecurity experts, or should everyone be learning how to do cybersecurity? Yeah. So I think we have to. We we need both, right? Like you know, like I, I mean, we need everybody to participate in the, this process, right? We do need cyber ex security experts like Grant, you know, in industrial making sure the product you got is safe, right? Like uh, uh, the whole system design process is good, right? And we also need the developer to have more like uh, 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 focus on the security aspect of the product, right? despite the fact that I know that you have the deadline to, for the spring, right? To deliver, right? But, but still like uh, uh, think about finding a bug after delivery, we cost much more than finding a bug when you just do the development, right? So. So for, from developer's perspective, yes, we also need, to, but also from the user's perspective, right? User is also very important, right? Cyber, this, is the, this is the Canada Cybersecurity Awareness Month and people should, 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 should you know, be educated, right? What is the appropriate practice, right? 
So let's say use different passwords for so many, like you should use different passwords for all different accounts. You should use a password manager. You should use multi-factor authentication, right? Yes, we keep recommending the same, just like Graham mentioned, the same issue happens uh, like from time to time. And yeah, we have to recommend the same thing like every year, right? So yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Stephen. Yusra? Yeah, so I guess I'll echo what Stephen and Glenn has just said. Um, there is a massive demand for cybersecurity professionals. There exists a huge gap in cybersecurity skills and companies around the world are worried about um, the current scarcity of cybersecurity talent. So it's definitely not to the level where it needs to be to fight and stand against the cybercrime. And for so for students, there is like substantial opportunities out there for cybersecurity. Now, speaking of the mobile ecosystem, uh, so as we know, the mobile systems are now becoming an integral part of the smart ecosystem in general. Now, mobile systems are powering um, like uh, uh, different types of smart devices, like uh, smart watches, smart cars, smart automation systems. So these systems often combine different areas like traditional systems, uh, AI, NLP, and even control engineering. So uh, there is a substantial demand now for talent with AI, uh, with AI, NLP background, and even control engineering. So coming from such background would certainly be highly valuable under the smart ecosystem. Yeah. So even like electrical engineers who know about security, physical security would be of more demand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that insight, Yusra. And Kareem? Thanks, mate. Um, I mean, uh, let me get back to that question specifically, like about grad studies in software security and cryptography. I mean, the obvious thing is like, there's probably going to be part of your degree there where you need to take courses. So look for the courses that are relevant to security and software security, but don't think that this, that that's it. Like this will only get you that far, like maybe 20% or 30% of the, of the knowledge or the opportunities that will be there. So that will give you like the, 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 the good theoretical background that you need, but you need to accompany that with more practical and hands-on experience. Um, so there are plenty of conferences that would organize hackathons or, or, or contests or capture the flag events, for example, that you can participate in and detect vulnerabilities in, in real systems using tools. Uh, I don't know if I can actually share links here in the chat or not, but maybe I'll share it with May and May can share it. Um, GitHub, for example, the security lab at GitHub, uh, they do have a capture the flag event uh, every few months or so, uh, where you can get to use code KL. Well, I'm biased because I'm in static analysis, so I'm, I'm just going to plug in some uh, advertisements there for static analysis tools out there. Uh, you can actually get to use their static analysis tool to detect vulnerabilities in systems. And it's, it's a kind of like a nice competition and it provides opportunities to have hands-on experience, network with people, talk to different people and have this kind of practice that you might not necessarily find in a course uh, or even in, sometimes in your research. Uh, as for research opportunities, I think security is a, is a large umbrella under, underneath which like there's lots of things going on. So even looking at it from a programming language perspective, as I usually do, you can look at it from the sense of, okay, we are going to design a language that would uh, have security built in into it so that it enables developers to, to sort of automatically reap the benefit of having or developing a secure system from the get-go. But then there's a lot of challenges that can come along with that, how usable that language would be, what kind of, how we're going to compile it, how we're going to run it, how we're going to run it in a way that is actually going to yield like adequate performance so that you don't achieve security on, 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 on like uh, against uh, uh, or uh, uh, versus the performance, the runtime performance of the systems that are going to be built with that language, or even looking at it from an information security perspective. Well, it's nice that you can develop a data flow analysis, for example, or a static analysis, but as Glenn was saying, if it has a lot of false positives, well, developers are not going to use it. So all this research that you have done is good maybe for academia and getting papers out there, but does it actually push the limits a bit further in practice or not? It needs some adoption. And, and the, the, one of the ways that you can convince developers to use things is that something the analysis tool would integrate smoothly into their workflow. So this is where usability comes in place, how that will disrupt their workflow because they, they're shipping products, right? That, that's the first thing that they want to do. They want to ship products. And if you can help them ship products, but still build the system securely, then that's great. 
So think about security in terms of the data flow analysis, at least from my perspective, in terms of usability of the tools, how people are actually going to use the tools. And also in terms of the fact that not everybody is interested or willing to invest the time to learn about cybersecurity, rightfully so. Like, I mean, we're not going to build cybersecurity experts in everything. Otherwise, all developers at all companies should know about distributed systems, maybe now blockchain and machine learning and security. I mean, there, there, is, there is very little time for people to do the, 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 the tasks and the work that they are supposed to do. Uh, and we just don't want to burden them all with that. So it's our, uh, I think, uh, duty that as researchers, we can come up with uh, uh, ways that we can help them along the way without having every single person working on a, on a product or a system to be an expert in every single aspect of it. Uh, thank you so much, Karim. Thanks for that insightful uh, uh, information. So with that, you, you and Stephen kind of mentioned a couple of things, and I want to pivot on that to uh, my next question is this is the Cybersecurity Month in Canada. So what can users do, users of software do to be more secure? And at the same time, kind of touching on Glenn's point on we make the same mistake over and over again as developers, what can uh, the developers do to not make the same mistakes over and over again? Or, what are some of the things that we can do? And, and uh, maybe I'll start this time with Steven because he brought up the Cybersecurity Month and then I'll go from there. At least from yeah. your malware perspective, what do you think users should not do? There's many things that you just don't do, but uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, it's, 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 sometimes it's typical for me. Like sometimes it's also, I, 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 let's say for some email that comes with some suspicious link, I just want to see what does it look like and spam their database, right? So, um, um, so it's even difficult. Like I understand it's a difficult problem. So, so, uh, so uh, this month uh, we did uh, for all of our lectures to educate uh, the students about the importance of cybersecurity and ask them to help go home and teach their parents how to patch things, how to update the device, etc. Um, so, I think from the user's perspective, I think first is that you have to develop a sense of uh, security awareness. So awareness is the most important thing because the practice may change from time to time, you know, like, okay, now you have multi-factor authentication, but maybe later on you have something else. So um, 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 the techniques may change over time, but the awareness is, is something that should like drive uh, people's motivation to keep adopting new behavior to be more secure, right? Um, so let's say uh, for the user, of course, uh, uh, you know, the typical recommendation these days that you should have a different password for uh, all your applications, right? Most of the uh, password is because of the uh, the same credentials used in uh, used in different applications, and you will be still amazed to see how simple the password, uh, people's password, uh, used in modern uh, applications. Um, and multi-factor authentications is very important, and only if it's doing right. Um, uh, because recently there's also an attack that's uh, kind of um, 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 kind of changed the database in a way that. Uh, um, the authentication message, the send the text message asked for the authentication code, actually send it to a different phone that's uh, created by the attacker rather than the actual user, right? A more secure but more expensive way to do it is using a proper authentication app, let's say Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. But of course, that is more expensive and people may not like to adopt it, right? So there's also a trade off, just, just like you already mentioned, between usability and the security, right? But I think that's why I say awareness is the, is the most important thing. Have to be aware of the security patches, have to be aware of the, um, 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 what is the new practice that coming out um, um, given the current context of security. Uh, and for the developers, I think, yeah, for the developer, I think it's again, it's the awareness is also very important. Let's say in your spring retrospect or in your spring reveal, you should have to do security with review of what you're gonna deliver, right? So let's say review of the code, uh, the code is there security testing, right? So is there any actual security testing uh, component in your CI pipeline, continuous integration pipeline? So every single time you make a pull request, is it actually test for all the vulnerability that can find using Corium static analysis tool or or the other uh, uh, dynamic analysis tool against the program, right? Maybe uh, 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 some of the components are more complicated. Should, 
concept of fuzzy testing or dynamic testing, but at least you have awareness to see that, okay, there should be some components in there to make sure the product you deliver is secure and the code that you commit to the, the actual production branch is actually vulnerability free, right? Well, of course, we cannot make vulnerability free of everything, but at least from based on what we can test, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to use, right? So, and the second thing for the developer is about us, uh, uh, incidents response. So I think BlackBerry did a wonderful job on this regard. So what happened if there's a security incident about your product, how long was the lead time that you're gonna release a patch to fix the problem, right? So earlier last year, we have uh, incidents against the silence product. Like basically there is a pass, uh, uh, there, is a, there was uh, um, universal, it's not kind of, actually it's not universal, but kind of like a trick to get rid of the antivirus engine but BlackBerry fixed them in just two days. They released a patch right after. So this is very good, right? So it's not just about how you're gonna develop a good secure product because we can't fix all the security, but honestly, right? So it's also about how good your policy, your, uh, 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 your process to actually release the patch for the public and ask them to adopt the patch. Yeah, so that's my, uh, my two cents of this uh, aspect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steven. Karim? Yes, um, I think Steven summarizes pretty well by saying awareness. I think awareness and, and having the knowledge is, is definitely something that we both users and developers need uh, uh, at this point. And, and I would I would say that also for users, not just awareness of security and, and knowing what how to how to secure your passwords, how to secure your information, but also awareness about privacy. If you are using a free service you're paying for that service with something. It might not be money, but it might be your data. So you need to know how your data is going to be used uh, uh, as a commodity or as a price basically for, for that free service that you're using. Uh, nothing is for free. Uh, you're paying it with, you're paying for it, that service with something, but you just need to be aware again and have the knowledge about how that data is going to be used so that you're comfortable with the choice that you're making. Um, that's one thing. I think on the developer side of things, I think us as researchers, again, like we have, we have a lot more to do there. Yeah, we keep saying, yeah, developers should do this. They should learn that technology. They should learn more secure languages, maybe like Rust, as I see one of the questions here is mentioning. But again, like they have a limited amount of time to do the task that they are supposed to do, which is shipping products and getting products in, in people's hands right out there as quickly as possible. Uh, and as efficiently as possible. So I think we as researchers need to come up with even more ideas and more practical solutions that can help them along the way uh, in, in, the, in, in terms of both using, securing the systems more by building better analyses, better tools, more usable tools, but also in, in ways that we can help them um, perhaps not fall into the same mistakes or errors or bugs all over again, like the cross-site scripting issue that Graham was mentioning. Uh, analyses can help with that. But why don't developers use them? Well, because they might have a lot of false positives again. They might be just too slow. Maybe they are just not providing an interesting or usable enough interface for developers to use. So they are just not going to bother using it. So I think for the side of developers, yes, they should be aware more about security and the privacy uh, ramifications of the code that they are implementing and shipping out there. But again, researchers should do a bit more uh, or maybe a lot more rather uh, to help them out along the way as well. Thank you so much, Kareem. And you kind of briefly mentioned about um, Rust here. Uh, what is your opinion on developers learning and using Rust instead of, does that make everything, does, does it solve the problem or? No, it doesn't solve the problem. It, 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 okay, maybe it's a, it's a step in the right direction for some definition of right direction. But again, like eventually, over the long period of time, people, and by people, I mean actors out there will figure out, okay, what are the weaknesses of the Rust type system or the Rust ecosystem in general, and they will exploit it. And that's what many researchers are actually currently working on is figuring out how we can even make the whole stack of building systems using Rust even more verifiable, more secure, even than it is right now. But it solves part of the problem. But again, like if, if the problem is just using a more secure language, then we already have these languages. We just need to convince people to use them and uh, problem solve. But that's not going to happen because even if we come up with the language that people can use from now on, what about all the legacy code and the legacy systems that are out there? 
uh, I mean, uh, my, my colleagues here, they already mentioned that even fixing an already existing bug that we know it exists and we know where it is, takes time and resources. So imagine all the legacy systems that are built in C and C++, are we, gonna, are we going to just abandon them? I don't think so. They are going to exist and they're going to stay there for a long period of time, if not forever. And we need to think about those as well. If I, if I can just jump in actually on the Rust thing as well, um, because one of the other challenges that we have is if you're starting to implement or re-implement a system in a new language, there are certain types of vulnerabilities that sure, Rust might do very well at protecting against those, but there's other types of vulnerabilities which are just logic errors and they're not gonna really depend on the language you're implementing it in. And so to take a system that has had 20 years of experience to get rid of some of these logic vulnerabilities and just re-implement it is not necessarily going to, in the short term, result in a more secure system. Yep. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. 20 years of bug fixing will now be gone because, and, and you're probably trying to write that, make that transfer in a short period of time so that there's little downtime as well. So yeah. a lot of corners may be cut there. Yeah. Yusra, do you have anything else to add to this? Yeah. So I guess that a lot of, um, um, so for the mobile ecosystem, there are a lot of commonality for what Stephen has just recommended and also has what, what Karim has recommended. So um, so for concerning what users need to do to make their devices more secure, it's highly recommended to keep the mobile devices up to date and patch on time. There are a lot of research that shows that uh, mobile users are unnecessarily opening the door to vulnerabilities by simply not patching their devices. Now, the second thing is um, it's highly recommended to download apps from the official uh, markets instead of going to a site, download an app, or maybe click on, on, a, on a link in an SMS to download an app, or even use in like secondary market to download apps. Those are very known carriers for um, uh, malicious code distribution. Now, I think also in the context of Android, it's very important to inspect the permissions that your application requests. So if you download an app, make sure to check the permission that it requests and use your own judgment to check whether it makes sense. For example, I would be highly suspicious of a gaming app that tries to uh, make phone calls in the background. Yeah, so now concerning what developers need to do. So uh, in the context of mobile frameworks, there are two types of developers. We have framework developers and we have applications developers. So for framework developers, let's say Google developers or uh, Samsung developers, there are a lot of recommendations that they need to adhere to to make sure that their systems are secure. First of all, the companies always set like security specifications. So uh, if you're developing, let's say some framework module, make sure to stick to those uh, um, security specifications that are set by the vendors. And they should not use their own standard to, or their own field to um, put some access control, let's say. Now, uh, I also think that uh, security should always be taken as a design issue. So like uh, it should never be incrementally uh, uh, in integrated into a system. And we have seen a lot of uh, cases where um, evolutional security was so problematic. Like in Android, I'm not sure if you know that, but Android was developed with this uh, single user feature. So there is one single user that can use a device, but suddenly um, Google has decided to make Android a multi-user feature. And um, now you can think of all the potential security problems that could happen if the uh, new security features are not properly implemented into the system. So we've seen cases where uh, secondary users were able to spy on primary users by simply exploiting this missing access control that were not there um, in the newly um, uh, uh, developed systems. Uh, so uh, when, now if we're talking about um, uh, application developers, what they need to do, I think the most important thing is they have to adhere to the principle of least privilege. So um, whenever they develop their apps, they need to simply request the permissions, minimum set of permissions for the proper execution of the app. Like requesting any additional privilege would open the door to vulnerabilities and exploit by maybe embedded libraries within the app. So that simply doesn't make sense. Now, uh, another thing is, I think Steven has also uh, touched on that, is um, in application uh, development, developers should pay special attention to the sec security testing phase because uh, Android is, especially Android, it's uh, highly customized and fragmented. 
So uh, there are some security features that are supported on some devices. Others are not supported on other devices. So the security testing needs to account for all those various features and security properties. Yeah, I guess that's all. My end. Thank you, thank you so much, Yusa. Thank you so much. Uh, and there's like a follow-up question to one of the things that was discussed in this, and I'll kind of direct this towards um, Glenn uh, and, and, and then to the others is, uh, this is a question from uh, ENG, and I'm assuming that's Ian Goldberg. But uh, so, if there is a tension between rushing to get a product out of the door and security, is there a way to internalize that externality of security and privacy flaws so that there is a rationale for the com company to prioritize fixing them before shipping? Yeah, I know a number of people have said that that shipping products is important, but shipping products is not necessarily always the primary or only objective here. Uh, it costs a lot of money to fix problems in products that have already been shipped. Part of that's our own doing, um, but and part of that's just all the systems that we have in place. But again, it costs a lot of money. And if there's a vulnerability found in that shipping product, um, the, the costs might not all be monetary. Um, and so fixing things before they ship is definitely important. Um, and if you're taking a look at privacy um, as it relates to security as well, that's all. That's that's almost like a, a mitigation and saying, okay, let's say if there are vulnerabilities found, what is the consequence of that vulnerability going to be? And if you have a system that is designed where, for example, the server does not have plain text access to a lot of the user data, a compromise of that system is not going to be as catastrophic as the compromise of a system that hasn't taken privacy into account. Great, right. thank you so much, Glenn. And and others, have you looked at research in this area? Have you looked at how you can maybe incentivize this? Uh, I, I think I have two cents on this. So um um so I definitely realize the value of shipping a product. And for example, another thing is that let's say if the product has only one user or just for demonstration purpose, like. Um, maybe the security issue is less of a concern at the moment, right? I think it all depends on the context. So that's why it's very important in your software development process for your project manager as well as the team to have risk assessment the manager, a management to see what are the potential risks and what are potential course for each delivery product, what is the potential course to certain security breach on certain aspect of the product. If the cost is less, maybe it's not, it's not significant. Maybe shipping product is more important than you should ship product first, right? Maybe uh, the product is critical. You don't want to uh, fix any bugs after, let's say for, uh, for let's say for the, of the, the system that like controlling the car, etc. Of course, you want to do full fledged uh, security testing before you actually shipping the product, right? So I think it's all depends on the context and it's very important to have the uh, risk assessment and management uh, built in the software development process. Um, and if uh, if let's say for 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 new staff company or for for like a new 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 team or new partner that is building building up, so so without like a good expertise in in doing risk assessment, the, the easiest way to do it is just follow the CIA principle: confidential, confidentiality, integrity, you know, um, and availability. Right from these three aspects, analyze your system. And to see what is the potential risk and what is risk, what is the potential course, and then you can better judge uh, 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 which one is more important, shipping or or security. Because security is also there's something called testing adequacy, right? There's also something called security adequacy, right? So you can't make something that 100, 100 percent to be approved, fully proof, right? Um, there's gotta be something uh, happened that unexpected, right? So like one of the examples is that like maybe. Uh, one of the bits that flipped it in the computer, which is completely out of your control, maybe it's out of your hardware control as well. So, so, so um, um, yeah, so I think that's why risk management and control is more important in that regard. Yeah, that's, that is just my two cents on, on this thing. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I want to kind of ask the academics a, a slightly different question. And this is a question from Adam is, what do you think is the value of um, interdisciplinary research when it comes to uh, security, software security, and like working not just within different areas of computer science, but working across faculties. Uh, and what are some of 
what do you think some of the benefits are and what some of the barriers might be in doing this? Uh, Kareem, Yusra? Yeah. yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that that's really great. Uh, I mean, the caveat is finding the right network. Again, uh, I think Yusra, Yusra mentioned that uh, at the beginning of the panel today uh, and the right connections, or maybe it was Gwen, I don't remember exactly, finding the right connections so that you can uh, establish a collaboration that actually is, is productive in, in, in terms of the results of that research. But for example, something like the usability of, of, of these security tools so that developers are more inclined to use them. I think this would benefit a lot from interdisciplinary research with people from departments in humanities that not necessarily in computer science at all, but of course people in HCI and computer science can help with that. But I think if we want to have a wide uh, adoption of, of, of these tools, we want to understand how people perceive them and how people would, would use them and how we can make those tools more appealing to developers and to the general audience if we're talking about mobile devices and, and, and apps and stuff like that. Uh, and I think that will benefit from an interdisciplinary research as such. Thank you so much. You said? Yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to add to that. So um, I think interdisciplinary research is highly available in the context of smart device security. So uh, let's let us take an, uh, as an example a smart maybe camera monitor. So uh, it detects some motion and then it uh, it accordingly behaves to take picture. So think so if we apply traditional security to analyze or construct an attacking model here or what potentially could go wrong we won't be able to use simply system uh, security research. We will be able to analyze the system, but what about the physical side of the system? So um, like combining the cyber and the physical side of system security and uh, um, specific control engineering here is very important. So how do we um, um, formalize the problem to predict what's going to happen in case of a cyber flaw is happening at the, well, what would be the consequence at the physical layer? So that would require definitely interdisciplinary research in this case. And what do you think some of the barriers are in doing this? Like what, are, what do you foresee as some of the barriers in working with, as you working from a software perspective, working with a control engineer? Mm -hmm. Well, is the language that you speak in the technical language different enough that it's a barrier? I think trying to formalize a uh, problem that would uh, unify uh, the understanding of both cybersecurity as well as control engineering is very, very difficult. So like, how do I um, formalize my, the inspected output that I, that I would expect from the control engineering part? So how do I supply like correct inputs for the control engineering uh, uh, counterpart of the problem? Yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much. Steven? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, so my, my, my this low power, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, so for interdisciplinary, yeah, I think it's very important, like, because we need to deal with the users, right? Uh, and developers, so it's not just the system. So uh, it's all about a trade off between uh, usability and security. So uh, I think it's very important. Uh, for on my end, I deal with less of the actual human aspect. So the human aspect is the attacker. I don't have direct interaction. I cannot call them, you know, oh, guys, sit down and let's do a survey, right? Something like that, right? So um, um, so that is less on my perspective, but definitely uh, help, especially from the uh, user's perspective, that uh, um, uh, as well as the, let's say, for the developer's perspective, like what we can do. Um, yeah. Thank you. And for Glenn, I'm going to modify the question slightly. And this is from, uh, the previous question was from Adam, and uh, this question is um, from Mikolai. Uh, is security just a developer problem, or uh, does this go into the MBAs, the executive sphere as well, because they are the one who make budget decisions, right? So. Uh, so I think, the lack of security is everyone's problem um, because we're all paying the cost for that. Uh, in terms of making a system secure, um, it's going to take time, but it's also going to take research. Um, and um, if I can just jump over into the education piece of things as well, um, education isn't 
interesting approach, but the problem that I have with education, at least myself, is that education is not going to, at the end of the day, result in zero issues from a security standpoint. Um, attackers, as I said earlier, only need to find one issue we have to prevent against all of them. Um, and education with 100% compliance is uh, dreaming. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that we have. So I think there's a lot more research and a lot more deployment of the research that we've already got that's going to be needed here. Some of that's going to come with costs that maybe the MBAs might be interested in or and whatnot, and some of that might actually just reduce cost. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. And, and when I have you on the hot seat here, I want to ask you the question on how do you evaluate success? Ooh, how do I evaluate success in terms of, well, so I'll take that one in terms of mitigations, right? So mitigations are designed to make the vulner the exploitation of vulnerabilities that perhaps we haven't found make exploitation of those harder. Um, and so in that context, mitigation um, and measurement of success there is, okay, how much extra time have we caused the attacker to take in order to actually be able to develop a working exploit for whatever vulnerability they happen to find. Great. Others in academia, what do you evaluate as success? Yusra, do you want to start? I think one of the most um, available thing that I uh, that could be used as a measure to evaluate success is like, um, um, are we able to identify vulnerabilities before um, hackers? Are we able to uh, uh, develop mitigation, just like what Glenn said, before exploitation in the wild? Yeah, and also, how effective are our solutions to mitigate these problems? Okay. Yeah. Stephen, could you, do you have anything else to add to that? Or? So do you mean do you mean like success of the research we're doing or success of like uh, can you contextualize it a bit more? I mean success of research is probably getting papers and grant money. That's papers, it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking the same. <laughs> Thank you, Corinne, for shutting <laughs> out. <laughs> And students completing their dissertation, going and doing great things, and you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course. I mean, I mean, all, all that is important. I, I also agree with Yostra that I, I I like to see the effect that the research we're doing in 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 real life and in in practice more, and and that's what makes me happy about the work that that we do in when when it succeeds in real life. So it, it's one thing that it succeeds in a controlled lab environment in our highly reproducible experimental evaluation that we published papers about but if we can find like this one or two bugs in real life that our tools can detect and that they were not be able to detect previously that for me is at least for me that's the real success for the for the for the work that we're doing great great and i'm gonna wrap up the panel with one last question what exciting thing are you looking forward to in the next few years and uh i'll start maybe with yusra and then go from there yeah i think i'll submit it yeah okay so i think um the exciting thing that i would expect on at least on the mobile security research is um going back to the into this interdisciplinary or even within the same context of computer science, like what areas could we combine to uh, to tackle security? So um, as we know, like, and as I've already mentioned, all these uh, smart systems are now um, leveraging mobile systems for different purposes. Now we are integrating functionalities of uh, AI, voice, maybe for voice recognition, object detection. And um, also we leverage an NLP, we're leveraging control engineering, in this eco smart ecosystems. So uh, I think that this would shape the future of uh, mobile security in the future. Uh, it would certainly be this interesting interplay of different areas. And uh, uh, now any security research would need to touch onto several aspects within the cyber world as well as the physical world. And I think 
this is not really a future agenda, but rather we've already seen uh, problems in this domain, like attackers have already started attacking the smart ecosystem. Uh, like uh, we've seen cases where um, uh, problems in voice recognitions have been uh, exploited to, um, to open the door to complete strangers. Now we are exploiting the cyber problem to attack the physical world. And also in one of my recent work, we have showed how um, vulnerabilities in the smart TVs could be exploited to um, escalate the privilege of attackers and spy on users. So basically you could put the device or the smart TV into fake off mode and uh, trick the user into believing that the TV is off while it's actually spying on users and recording voice or using the camera in the background. We've also seen cases where um, uh, access control vulnerabilities in the cyber world have been exploited in the smart TVs to flicker the display in a stealthy manner. So users would be watching their TVs, but they are unaware that the display is flickering, flickering that can cause, according to medical um, uh, reports, uh, problems at the visual health. So we see that this transition from the cyber world into the physical world, which is, I think, what would shape the future of research now. Wow. Thank you. That's it's scary and still hopeful that you're working on it. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, so maybe first, uh, Ekfum to uh, correct Spiri's uh, um, uh, discussion about the, the criteria. So that's the first exciting things coming out. Of course, uh, there are going to be more publications coming up from uh, each of us um, addressing different security challenges in different domains. That is uh, super exciting. Um, and then the second thing, like uh, at least just for myself, is that um, um, I'm very excited to see there are going to be more AI solutions that is coming up to assist uh, human beings, let's say, to, to help uh, cybersecurity analysis or software developers to mitigate the exponentially increasing threats or security artifacts that we have to analyze or to make uh, you know, our software development process more safe and secure, to deliver more safe and secure products at end. Um, so actually, um, um, I, I really like the idea of uh, uh, data-driven solutions in this regard, especially according to uh, Grant earlier mentioning, people just make the same mistake over and over again, right, in the past. So the, the, actually the reason why I really like to work in cybersecurity is that I, I, I used to like play video games a lot, especially the combat game that like, you know, you fight another opponent one-to-one uh, uh, -one, game right so uh, at the time like when i started my master i said okay i'm gonna do cyber security right red blue team cyber exercise intrusion defense i'm gonna fight against the future because the future is like you know don't know what is the attackers looks like right and then after a couple of years like, oh my god actually i'm not fighting against the future i'm fighting against the past because like i mentioned you just see the same thing keep repeat like like you see the history keep like repeating itself right so let's say for ransomware like despite the fact that there's like uh this year, you see so many ransomware crossing more than 600 million, so like, uh, uh, even just in, in, uh, across the globe. But ransomware is not new, right? The first ransomware was in 1989, right? What is the call? Is it cyber orb or something? Yeah, that is. Uh, that was the year that I was born, right? Like that, that is uh, the same thing that people are using this day. It's just maybe uh, delivered for a different channel, and then people still don't have the good, like uh, the awareness of security. They still click the link and run the malware on their machine and then spread across their internal organizations, right? So uh, AI solutions can help on this regard, especially kind of analyze what kind of past, uh, past knowledge that we come from in different domains, let's say in reverse engineering and security analysis and in bug finding, vulnerability discovery, look into what is happening in the past, maybe helping, um, helping a reverse engineering security to pick up to do the analysis faster, right? Because you know, to train really good security analysis it takes time and resource, right? So it's not like you can have them if you pay, right? So you have to pay them for many, many years and then you can train a very good one, right? So, but having AI as something that's helping may help us to significantly reduce the uh, computational or, you know, manual efforts in doing so many things in different uh, domains. Yeah. So that is the, uh, the most exciting things that I'm looking for. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. And uh, uh, Glenn? Yeah, so I think probably the thing that I'm looking forward to uh, most about the future, and I don't even know if this is two or three years out or whether or not this is an ongoing thing that we're going to be dealing with for many, many years, 
and I'm not speaking on behalf of BlackBerry, but machines being able to augment the human interactions instead of punting our security decisions on the user, right? And it might be AI based, but it might not. Uh, something that your Yursa said, I'm sorry, I may have butchered that. Um, if a dialogue pops up, right? The user's probably just going to accept it. If you have a gaming app that requests phone permission, the user's going to accept it. Because these are all examples of what the users can do to be more secure, and they involve the user doing something. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the user having to do a whole lot less to actually be secure. And this involves tools as well. Right now, if a tool finds a possible security issue, it punts it to the user, right? In this case, the developer or the user of the tool um, in terms of figuring out, is this actually a legitimate issue? Um, so less of those as well in the future. Let's, let's stop punting as much stuff to the user. Great. And Karim? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, machine learning systems are becoming more ubiquitous, which sounds like the first sentence in many papers, at least in the next uh, few years. Uh, but on a more serious note, like, I think, um, like, one of the problems that we are going to see is that, like, how we're going to secure those systems as well, because in, in that case, we, we, we are thinking so far that attackers are probably human beings who are sitting behind a computer and trying to attack systems. But we might get a little bit more sophistication over the next few years, if not already, that's already out there uh, with systems that might be targeting uh, other systems that are based on machine learning and so on. But even like securing machine learning systems that people use in their everyday, like uh, face ID, touch ID, or password management and stuff like that. And I think at least in, in, in my area, in programming language and program analysis, we can help a little bit with that, both in terms of building the system itself so that from the ground up, it's built using technologies uh, in terms of languages and runtime environments that sort of reduce the risk of these uh, being exposed to developers and be, sorry, being exposed to users and also helping developers along the way. Uh, and the other problem that I also find interesting is related to Ian's question from before is nobody can build a system that doesn't have any vulnerabilities in it or, or zero or bug free, right? So, so there are going to be bugs, there are going to be vulnerabilities. What we're all after here is trying to reduce the effect of those bugs and vulnerabilities to the minimum, such that even mitigation, if, if we have to do that later on or fixing those bugs later on, it would be have it would have reduced costs. And some of the things that my group has been recently trying to work on is can we use game theory in order to have a model of these kind of players in, in that game that we're thinking about, which is the game between the attackers and the defenders, us being the defenders who are building the system and the attackers being any malicious player that wants to uh, um, uh, exploit a vulnerability in the system. And can we have a model that will basically tell us, are we risking parts of the system if we don't detect certain bugs or if we miss detecting certain bugs? And if we are, can we actually quantify and measure that risk in a way uh, that enable us to choose tools in a different way such that we can have better coverage and, and better coverage doesn't in terms of percentage of bugs that we want to cover but in terms of bugs that are uh, more serious or bugs that are more relevant or bugs that can cause more harm or more damage if they go undetected uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a, a couple of things uh, released soon about that from from the group so i look forward to that as well thank you so much Karim, and uh that's a lot of exciting work that I'm looking forward to reading. Uh, with that, I want to thank the four panelists first, uh, Glenn, Yusra, Stephen, and Karim. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your knowledge with the rest of the group. I also want to thank um, Justin and Davian for all the tech support here, for setting this up. It was pretty seamless for us. Just click a link and join. So thank you so much, Justin. Thank you so much, Davian. Uh, and finally, I want to thank uh, CPI and Ashokan for giving us the opportunity to put this panel up in this month and uh, discuss these important topics. Thank you so much, Ashokan. Thank you, May, and thank you all the panelists for a very interesting uh, panel and, and also making, um, taking time to make yourself available for this. Um, I think the uh, significant uh, audience stayed till the end, and that's, I think, a testament to the level of interest of the audience. Um, 
Uh, next week, we will continue with the um, series of events. Uh, there will be two events next week, Thursday. Um, note that they'll be at a different time. At 4 p.m., we'll have a poster session, followed by at 6 p.m., the launch of the new public outreach series with the inaugural talk, uh, CPA talk by uh, Ian Goldberg and uh, Jen Whitson. Um, you can register for those in the same way you registered for this event by going to the event page. If you don't remember what it is, you can go to uwattle.ca slash CPI and, and then uh, it should be easy enough to figure out. So thank you again. And uh, I hope to see most of you next week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.